the Jaipur bookmark reflects the core values of the publishing industry. And it brings together some of the greatest publishing professionals from around the world. जयपुर बुकमार्क एक ऐसा प्लेटफॉर्म है जहाँ पे कि बिजनेस को समझने का एक अपॉर्चुनिटी मिलता है सो आई थिंक जे बी एम इज समथिंग विच इज़ फैंटेस्टिक एंड पीपल हु डोंट नो अबाउट इट उनको आना चाहिए उनको इसका हिस्सा बनना चाहिए जयपुर बुकमा कम एंड सेलिब्रेट लिटरेचर मीट ऑथर्स एजेंट्स पब्लिशर्स ज्वाइन अस एट द जयपुर बुकमा On behalf of Jaipur Bookmark Festival advisors Aditi Maheshwari Goyal, Namita Gokhale, Navin Kishore, Neeta Gupta, and Urvashi Butalia, festival producer Sanjay K Roy, and all my colleagues at Team Work Arts, we welcome you to the eighth edition of Jaipur Bookmark. The Indian publishing industry has grown rapidly with the world's attention converging on it. Creating a meaningful B two B platform for publishers was thus essential. and the jaipur bookmark was conceived to run parallel to the jaipur literature festival in the 7 years since its inception jbm has fast emerged as a nerve center for the south asian publishing industry and is indeed a focal point where books mean business in 2020 the world grappled with the pandemic and businesses learned to reinvent themselves and adapt to an entirely new digital idiom Jaipur Bookmark 2021 is being held as a virtual event and as always continues to bring together all stakeholders of the business of books over meaningful discussions and far reaching resolutions a warm welcome to all of you to this wonderful session at the virtual Jaipur Bookmark 2021 European Union Prize for Literature writing from across Europe Anne Bergman Matthias Navrat Melis Friedenthal and Rodan Al Galibi in conversation with Neeta Gupta the session is being organized by cultural relations platform CRP an EU funded project in collaboration with the Jaipur Bookmark the European Union Prize for Literature EUPL puts the spotlight on the wealth of Europe's contemporary literature it ensures a wider international audience as well as access to readers beyond national and linguistic borders three authors from across europe along with the director of the federation of european publishers will be in conversation with publisher neeta gupta 
on the richness and diversity of literature from the continent. Anne Bergman Tehon has been director of the Federation of European Publishers since 2004. Before that, she has occupied positions in the association. She has also worked as a journalist and in public relations. Matthias Navrat was born in 1979 in Poland and moved to Germany in 1989. His novels were awarded many times, most recently with the European Union Prize for Literature 2020 for The Sad Guest. His fifth novel, Traveling to Maine, will come out in August 2021. Millie Friedental is active in both academia and literature. He has published novels, short stories, and plays. In 2013, he won the European Union Prize for Literature. Rodan Al Ghalidi. Netherlands based Rodan Al Ghalidi, a writer of Iraqi descent, studied to be an engineer in Iraq before fleeing to the Netherlands to escape military service in 1998. His request for asylum was first rejected, and since he was not allowed to train in an official Dutch language course, he taught himself the language and started writing. He is now considered a Dutch writer. In 2007, he was among those asylum seekers who were granted general pardon by the Dutch parliament. Nita Gupta is the publisher at Yatra Books and a literary consultant with a special emphasis on translations. She is also the chief editor of Bharti Anuvad Parishad's quarterly journal on translations Anuvad. She has been working towards creating publishing connectivities across different languages and cultures. She has edited a volume of essays on translating from and into Indian languages titled Translating Bharat, Reading India. Ladies and gentlemen, we present to you European Union Prize for Literature, Writing from Across Europe, Anne Bergman, Matthias Navrat, Millie Spirental, and Rodan Al Ghalibi in conversation with Nita Gupta. Nita, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Anubhav. Uh, so I'm delighted here. I'm delighted to be in conversation with three wonderful writers from across Europe and uh, the director of the Federation of the European Publishers. Uh, so as Anubhav says, we are going to be putting the spotlight on the wealth of contemporary European literature in this session. Our aim at Jaipur Bookmark has always been to pique the business interest of publishers, translators, readers, not just in the subcontinent, but across geographies. So uh, to, uh, to set the mood for the day, you know, I'd like to begin with you, Anne, um, you know, since you represent the Federation of European Publishers, can you tell us a little bit more about the EU prize and its objectives, and also a little bit about the, the consortium uh, of which which the European uh, publishers are also uh, a part of. So can you just, can we just put the kind of, you know, a little, uh, some, uh, the story behind the prize. So over to you, Anne Bergman from the Federation of European Publishers. Um, with pleasure. First of all, thank you for inviting me. And uh, although I wish I'd be with you in India, well, I'm doing it from Brussels. Uh, so the prize was uh, created together with the European Commission, who is the main founder of the prize, uh, in 2009. And the objective of the prize is to uh, look across Europe and broader than the European Union uh, boundaries for uh, emerging authors who could then be translated in the various languages, because, you know, one of the strengths of uh, Europe is the diversity of languages across the continent and to have them uh, translated as much as possible. I've just noted that uh, all, all three authors here, well, Nelis has been translated 14 times, Rodan 11 and Matthias who had just received the prize. So uh, he's not lagging behind, he's just uh, received it uh, uh, less than a year ago. He has uh, five translation already. So uh, in 2009, when we launched the prize, the really our objective was to support translation and support visibility of uh, authors from across the, the, the continent. Uh, you ask about the consortium. The consortium is composed of three partners. Um, my organization that represents uh, book publishers at European level. Uh, is one of the partners together with the European Writers' Council 
and the uh, European and International Booksellers Federation. And together we formed the book chain uh, in its uh, uh, um, uh, large acceptation. And, and the idea is that then we, 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 we can organize local juries because we have local, uh, we have colleagues in most of the countries that are concerned by the price, have to know that uh, the countries are changing a little bit over time, but uh, as we speak, there are 41 countries that are covered. And it's a very broad definition of Europe as uh, this year we are organizing a jury in Tunisia. So that's uh, a broad uh, acceptation of Europe. Uh, in Since 2009, we have uh, awarded the prize to 135 winners. We are no, uh, mm. yeah, and, and we have all promoted them. And I would say, I, I don't have the exact figures, but all of them have a, a number of translation, which I believe may have happened anyway, but are certainly they, they have benefited from the exposure of the prize. Um, that's, what, that's wonderful. In fact, what I wanted to ask you also as part of the introduction was that did the, uh, has the pandemic this last year, has that made a difference or, you know, did, how did the pandemic affect, because you did have a prize announcement in 2020 as well. So if we could just put that in perspective before I go on and speak to the other writers as well. Well, I, I think uh, Matthias can, can talk about the consequences of the pandemic. Normally, uh, the authors, uh, when they receive the prize, we organize a nice ceremony in Brussels and they all get to meet each other and to get advice from a number of professionals. But also we have, uh, we organize their presence in a number of events. First, and uh, in, in uh, local bookshop, when I say local, I mean national bookshop so that they, that they uh, increase their visibility also on at their own market but then we have agreements with a number of book fairs across Europe where uh, there are some stages with either the national winners or the winners that, that have been translated or or the annual winners etc. Uh, this obviously uh, as we have this virtual event this has been virtual too and I I think it's a miss despite of of the, the fact that you can reach a number of people online, I think meeting your readers, but that I would leave it to the authors to comment. Sure, thank you so much, Anne. So uh, let's go to uh, Milis Friedenthal, who's here with us from, he's from Estonia, and he writes speculative fiction. Uh, Milis has also been a lecturer, as uh, we know, of theology and history. And I think all this meets in the kind of books he writes. So, uh, Milis, I was listening to an interview of yours sometime back in, in which you say that this prize is a forward-looking prize, that it not only recognizes your work or the published work so far, but influences what uh, on how you write in the future. Would you like to comment on that? Over to oh, Milis yes, yes. Tal. Uh, yes, I can do that. Uh, and uh, what I uh, meant uh, is that uh, uh, this uh, prize is um, uh, uh, forward-looking in the sense that it uh, fosters translation. And uh, translation is something that is uh, always so that uh, it hasn't happened yet. It will happen sometime in the future, hopefully. And uh, really, as I already mentioned, uh, my book has been translated now into 14 languages uh, in Europe. And it has been a terrific experience, actually, because uh, 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 all the time when the new translations take uh, place, you get the chance to travel there, to meet people there uh, in the book launch. Of course, uh, this pandemic uh, will uh, or has uh, changed uh, things a bit. But uh, my experience uh, before the pandemic has been really, uh, really great. And... Um, also, it's uh, very interesting in this uh, regard that it uh, uh, expands uh, uh, my own horizon a lot, uh, so that uh, traveling uh, uh, other uh, 
literature spaces, so to say, because every language uh, space is uh, uh, sort of uh, its own field in, in literature, uh, gives a, a good insight into how people think they are, how they write there, and uh, it also gives uh, some perspective to your own work. So uh, it is something that I've really enjoyed. It has been a terrific experience. Thank, thank you, Milis. Uh, to move on to Rodan Al-Khalidi, who is a Dutch author of Iraqi descent. Rodan, you in fact won the prize in 2011 yes. uh, for the novel uh, the Autist and the Carrier Print Pigeon. And yeah. I think that was the year where your uh, application for asylum in Netherlands was turned down. So could you tell us a little bit about this conflicting, you know, this uh, could you share your experience from this time yeah. you won the prize? It was a very funny story, actually. I went to Brussels to get the prize. And then uh, I am a refugee here. And, uh, and my situation was very difficult because I must make some courses and exams to be allowed to live outside the refugees camp in Holland. And I, 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 I couldn't get it because the question was very difficult for me. They are very stupid questions. Even the Dutch people cannot answer it sometimes. And, uh, I, <laughs> and when I come with this prize, the media was very interesting. How oh, it's happened? You get this wonderful prize and you fell down in the exam for the refugees. And uh, yeah, it, it was a really very funny uh, experience. Until now, I tell it in my reading as a joke. <laughs> but so it makes my situation very strong. Yes, of because course. Because the people began to ask themselves, how could happen that this man get this prize and uh, all the publishers, they began to send me mails and, uh, and how he didn't get the exam to live outside the refugees camp. They call it in Burgering. And, uh, yeah. and, and uh, yeah, it was really shocked for the people from the system because it was the proof that they get... Uh, the, the system is wrong, they thought in that time, not me. Right. In fact, by, and so, uh, you know, this is something we could talk about again and yeah. come back to. So which was the year when you finally got your asylum and you became a Dutch uh, writer? By I, I began to be a Dutch writer when I just arrived, when I just learned a few words. If I go to Jaipur two days, I am two days Indian writer. I don't belong to any country. I'm not Iraqi, not Arabic, not Dutch, because that is why I feel I want to be writer. And if I cannot be writer, I will be hippie, hippie or gypsy. I don't like to belong to culture, to language, to religion. And that means I don't want to be free from these things, but I want these things free from me. And, uh, and, 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 and that is also, sorry, I went very far from your question. No, but it's beautiful <laughs> to know that. Yeah, but I, fact, would like I, to tell about, I would like to tell about the European Union Prize of the Literature. Because it uh, means a lot of for me. In that time, I had nothing, no passport. My Dutch was also even better than my English now. And we are writers, we are good in making books, but we are not good in making names. And maybe 300 years ago, uh, the writers, he don't need name to travel to the readers because he don't think about the readers. He think about his soul, his, his mind. Mm. But in this time, we need this passport kind of name to go to the readers. When I get the European Prize of the Literature, I told you in one hour, this surprise gave me more than what I gave myself in all these years. 
because it let me traveling without me to all the readers. The 11 language, maybe now is more, I began to, to give readings in Holland even. Even in the, another city in Holland, they began to invite me because I'm the winner of the European uh, 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 prize. And I think when you get Nobel Prize, you get the money, you get uh, the room, you don't need to write anymore. But the European Union Prize is wonderful because you will get the name and you will think, I will write the books to make the name stronger. And <laughs> Thank you. Okay, lovely. lovely. So let's come to Matthias uh, Naurat, who's a Berlin-based writer of Polish origin. And in fact, Matthias, you're the most recent winner in 2020. And I'm sure your experience of the prize would be very different uh, than, uh, for instance, Milis or Rodan. So would you like to share with us? And in fact, Anne was also mentioning that maybe you could tell us about how different the experience was to win the prize in the year of the pandemic. Over to you, Matthias. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, uh, by the way, for uh, hosting us. I'm very blessed to be able to talk to you. So, well, in my um, in my um, uh, well newest uh, experience uh, of of this prize, I have to say that I don't I, I cannot say what it will bring in the future. Also, I'm already feeling this. Uh, a uh, strong, you know, uh, change in, for example, translations and so on. And uh, of course, I cannot uh, relate to what it means in terms of traveling because this was really impossible so far. But I still have to say, and I'm really grateful uh, to the whole consortium and to the people behind the prize because they, I really, I really could tell that they are working very hard behind the scenes. You know, they managed to. Um, to get a lot of uh, online meetings for us and I had conversations with you know uh, a radio in New York or with you in India so I had uh, kind of the feeling uh, of the global um, of the global impact of the price and I'm still waiting for the for the uh, physical travels and one uh, a slightly negative effect was that I I really would have met I would have liked to meet the other writers in person, you know, because it's still something else. If you meet somewhere and have a beer and, you know, talk uh, into, into the deep uh, nights about stuff. And this was impossible because as Melis um, pointed out, this is something very important, the traveling and the getting to know the people from other parts of Europe and the world and to be able to talk to them, even in my funny English, you know, but still it's uh, very, very important for a writer to open your uh, own horizon. And so I hope for this and uh, hopefully this pandemic will, um, you know, uh, become more and more uh, normal and things, I mean, not the pandemic, but the, but the things and the world will become more and more normal and I will be able to do so. And, uh, but um, only even, even with this pandemic and um, the constraints it uh, put on us, I really have to say that uh, a lot of things happened already. So, well, it's just great. Wonderful, wonderful. So we'll come, I'll come back to you uh, about some more questions. But before that, I'd like to go back to Anne. Um, and you know, this year, uh, book publishing has been severely hit, I'm sure in Europe as well. So could you tell us, you know, how would this would, might impact you know, going forward, uh, I mean, I, I know, for instance, in Europe, bookshops were also closed, but governments came and there were a lot of, you know, um, um, I think I'm sure the Federation as well uh, must have come to the aid of the publishers in Europe. So if you could tell us a little bit about how this might impact going forward and what kind of, you know, do you have any, uh, maybe not facts, but, you know, you could have stories that you could share with us about this in you know, uh, unprecedented year uh, for all of us in publishing. Over to you, Anne. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, it has hit uh, the sector, but very differently depending on the country. Uh, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, there are some countries where bookshops were never closed. 
I'm thinking Finland by, by example, where bookshop remained open uh, during the entire uh, pandemic. And uh, there are other countries where, uh, uh, well, they were completely closed. Some other countries helped uh, immediately the sectors with some uh, individual support for publishing and, and for, for the rest of the chain. Uh, on the whole, it's a very patchy situation where you have uh, Germany, which is a little bit down and, and France, which is even and uh, um, uh, to take again Finland, which is quite a growth. The Netherlands is also even. So, of course, all that has to be assessed with the figures of Christmas because, by example, in the Netherlands, there was uh, the bookshop closed, I think, a fortnight before Christmas, which is in Europe, a very important period uh, to sell books. So it's complicated. Uh, there are several countries where um, the, the governments have also put in into a more uh, long-lasting policies to support the, the book sectors. I think uh, our uh, champion is Italy, where they have really put together uh, a lot of measures. They've given to some uh, segment of the population vouchers to buy books so that uh, people go back into the bookshop. They have uh, deemed book essential and therefore bookshop essential retail shops so that even when everything else was closed but food but the bookshop remain open all over Italy. They've also uh, created something I, which I personally find simple, but very smart, is that they have injected uh, money into library acquisition. Libraries are invited to buy new books from their local bookshop, not from a, a, a giant distributor who would give them good price. No, from their local bookshop, they have to buy books. So. People going into libraries have uh, uh, new books and, and, and the most recent one. At the same time, this injects some cash within the, the entire system. So uh, unfortunately, uh, there are some other countries where uh, the, 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 the government has not supported the book sectors uh, uh, as well as they have done in Italy or in other countries. Uh, and those will suffer more in the future. I'm thinking Portugal lost 25% of their turnover uh, in 2020. Uh, mean, and, and one thing is that it affects more uh, the uh, authors who have a, uh, who are less visible on the, the, the public media and, uh, so, and, and also the smaller publishers who have less visibility. So that affects cultural diversity quite a lot. If I can just say a word about the UPL and that uh, the, the, I think what makes the prize very different from any others apart from the fostering of translation is that it's a prize which is organized nationally but then promoted internationally because uh, there would be no way that even if I take uh, the three authors here uh, that they would be people who would be able to, to, to read in all the languages. I mean, Estonian, uh, uh, Dutch and, and German, plus the usually 11 other languages. In it. So there's national juries that they, they have to follow very established criteria. And then they give us a, a, uh, a cycle or a number of authors. And Matthias will do our utmost to organize something so you can meet your, your colleagues. You'll come uh, at this some to meet me. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. I, so come can to I the talk part something about, about the books? Yes, of course. Of course, I'm coming back to you. I'm coming back okay. to you. Uh, uh, so we can start with uh, you, Rodan. I was just going to talk about the, you know, uh, from the perspective of translations, um, uh, you know, uh, obviously the prize influences in a major way translations and the promotion of your work. But did you work very closely with your translators? Were you able to, you know, uh, uh, what are the languages? So this is something that I'm going to open out to all the writers. And I'm going to, you know, lead it on to Milas and Matteo.
us, of course, is, is only recently experiencing that. But Rodan, you could tell us a little bit about your experience with the translations and whether you were able to work closely with the translators. Uh, 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 translating is very, uh, uh, very, uh, it's very difficult to give the uh, book another clothes, another soul, another body. Uh, you know, in India, Tagora, we have it in Arabic in maybe 20 translating, but one translating is Tagora of India, I think. And why? Because the translator, he was very free to make his own Tagora. And I, we go to, for example, from Germany or uh, Dante from Italy in Arabic, a lot of translating, but one is great. And always I am careful to read what say the translator. He said, I didn't follow the words. I will follow the soul of the author. And I say always to the translator, this is not Quran, this is not Bible. Do what you want. Write the book as your book is it. And you throw everything you think, oh, I cannot translating. That means it's not good. And this is my meaning, just for my books, maybe. And they was very happy, the translator. And why I do that? Because I believe it, but also because I am very lazy to give the book another time to another language. No, Sam, you have a child. He's 18 years. They say, go away, do what you want. Interesting. Milis, can I bring this question to you? Yeah. Milis, can I bring this question yeah. to you about translation? You said you've had 14 uh, translations ever since you won the prize. So can you just talk, 14 languages your books have been translated into. Can you tell us, because uh, Rodan shared a very interesting idea of just giving the book over to the translator and letting them interpret. Did you, on the other hand, did you work closely with any of your translators? And what was your experience with, uh, with the translations in different languages in, in Europe? Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, I, I think that this uh, depends very much on the translator, of course, because uh, translators do uh, their job uh, uh, individually and they have their own approaches. And of course, it depends a, a bit uh, also upon the text that you're translating. Uh, for example, my text uh, is a piece of uh, uh, historical fiction. And uh, this means that I have uh, uh, names, places, uh, uh, quotations uh, there that uh, need to be uh, sort of uh, checked. And uh, translators uh, often wrote me uh, uh, what kind of sources I used, uh, uh, whether this was a direct quotation or uh, did I change the quotation. So uh, actually, with most of my translators, I uh, work together quite closely. And I uh, even uh, at the end compiled uh, a quite substantial uh, list of uh, uh, questions and answers so that uh, one, uh, whenever uh, a new translator uh, approached me, uh, then I could already send that this is, uh, these are the questions that usually translators ask me. And, and, uh, and I think that translating is very interesting in this regard also because translators are uh, close readers. So uh, when you want uh, to familiarize yourself with a text, then translating is the best way to do it because you really get to know the text. So uh, in a way, the translators are the best readers uh, of your work. Mm. So I, I, I really uh, appreciate the work and, and uh, it has been a really a, a interesting experience for me because they find uh, uh, nuances in the text, or questions in the text that I overlook myself. So, uh, in a way, through translations, the text uh, becomes uh, uh, even uh, more interesting for me. So, uh, uh, I, I, I think it's 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 uh, translations are an immensely good thing uh, that can happen with a text. Uh, it's even so that you can say that. Uh, 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 a translation means that at least one person has found something uh, meaningful in the text. 
So when, when a text is translated, then uh, uh, you can hope that it uh, is maybe worth something <laughs> at least. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think translating is, is, uh, is an important and, and not uh, only when it happens to your work, I, I mean that uh, any kind of translation is, is important. So for example, here, uh, uh, in Estonian culture, uh, translation is something uh, that has laid foundation also to Estonian literary culture. Right. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, but I think, yes, you're right. And it, it sort of, it, it vindicates the original writing as well, in the sense that, you know, when you, I think that was a beautiful point you made there. Uh, Matthias, would you like to comment on, uh, you know, uh, on translation? You also, some of your books have come out in translation. And you're still, uh, I think the English translation has not yet uh, been published, right? So if you could tell us a little bit about how you work, whether you like to work closely, or as Rodan says, you prefer to give over the, uh, the charge to the translation, translator, would you like to comment on, um, on this? aspect of your work? <clears throat> uh, of course, I cannot talk a lot about translations of the sad guest, this recent book, because they are not uh, out yet and, and nobody ever uh, uh, wrote me so far. None of the translators, I think they are still, you know, uh, starting oh. the work, but I can tell you a little anecdote about the translation of my book, of my previous book, The Many Deaths of Our Grandfather Jurek, which is the book about Polish history and about my family history. And I wrote it in German, of course, because I write in German. And then it uh, had, and uh, then a Polish uh, publisher was interested. Um, so I knew that they would translate it into my mother tongue, right? So this is the one of the uh, few languages I could understand, you know, because in most cases, the book is translated into a language you don't understand. So you can never tell, is it a good translation or not? Uh, but in this case, I knew I would be able to. So I was really curious and I was really a little bit frightened also. And uh, the woman who translated it never sent me a word about it. She never wrote me an email, had no questions. I had previous uh, experiences, for example, the Croatian translator, and she wrote me like 20 pages of questions, as, as Milis uh, pointed uh, out earlier. But this one... She never wrote me. And then one day I just got the translation and I was really, you know, it's really strange to read a book you wrote in German and then to read it in your mother tongue. And, uh, and, and I started reading and I thought, wow, this is even better than in German. It's strange. And even my father, he, he wrote, he read it uh, too. And he wrote me, it's better. It's better than in German. And then I realized that I probably wrote it while writing it in German because it's about you know Polish topics and about Polish way of thinking about humor a lot I kind of thought in Polish while translating in myself into German and then she retranslated into Polish in, into the Polish uh, thinking and so this was really funny and she never wrote me any you know any questions and I guess it's like uh, Rodan says that you have to catch the spirit of a book you know uh, and it has not necessarily have to be word by word, but it has to catch something, yeah, maybe the soul or the spirit or something like that. And she managed to do it. And I was really, okay, strange. It, it was like, you know, parallel universe opened up and I saw myself in Polish. Uh, and so, yeah, it was, it was great. And I, this is really a very important work. Translators write, you know, they write a new book, actually. It's not... It says Matthias Navrat, but it's something they they write themselves out of almost nothing again. So I really admire this work. That's a lovely story. That's a lovely story, Matthias. That you actually in uh, uh, you know subconsciously wrote that book, thought that book in Polish and wrote it in German. So that was a lovely point you made there. Uh, now, you know, coming back to, uh, we have uh, about 15, 20 minutes here with us. Uh, what I wanted to just, you know, get a sense um, that, uh, you know, before we take the questions from the audiences, um, 
how, you know, this is a question for all of you and you can choose to answer it, that does the literary community give you hope? And, you know, especially in this year, a lot of us have gone back and we've thought about who, you know, and what holds us together. So would you, uh, should we start with you? And since, you know, we, we're going in a kind of a pattern as you like, um, but does this literary community that we all belong to, does this give you hope in the face of this, uh, you know, the pandemic and this absolutely, we, we really don't know what's happening in this year or, you know, whether things will improve. So in that, you know, this sort of a, a situation where we feel there is a kind of hopelessness, yet is this community, do you feel good about being here and can we, uh, when, I mean, is there something that you're looking, that it gives you something to look forward to in the coming, uh, in 2021? And over to you. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a good question, uh, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm within the optimistic community, so I, I think that this, this pandemic will be behind us one day, but that we are facing a lot of uh, more serious problems and and uh, on the longer term, and I think literature uh, opens us windows uh, on on other people's life and make us understand the importance of not just being local or, or, or national, but uh, broaden our, our views. Uh, I remember uh, Matthias saying in in the uh, book fest video we we did for Frankfurt Book Fair that this creates empathy, and we are in a a world where empathy is required more and more in order to address all of the challenges, whether climate change or 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 uh, um, the democratic problems that our societies are facing. Uh, in even in Europe, I mean, uh, we we think we thought we would be more or less uh, safe from that, but we are faced by a number of democratic challenges in Europe and. The good thing about the pandemic is that people uh, have read a bit more. So we can only hope that they have read more of uh, various European and, and beyond Europe, of course, uh, international authors to better understand the world and to start bringing a little solution at their own level. Right. Milis, would you like to talk about, you know, being a part of this literary community and what is it that you're looking forward to in 2021? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think it's uh, an excellent point that was uh, right now made that um, uh, literature is something that uh, gives us hope. And uh, uh, I'm myself uh, a theologian and intellectual historian by training. And looking back at history, uh, you can also tell that uh, always after some this kind of crisis events, uh, uh, literature uh, and actually to say uh, humanities more general have become uh, more important uh, because uh, uh, these events are something that people need to make sense of. And uh, to make sense of the world, uh, literature is one of the best tools that we have. So it's, uh, it has been always so that when something catastrophic happens, when uh, some uh, these kind of really terrible things uh, take place, then literature helps to make sense of it and to recover from it. And uh, so uh, in this sense, uh, I'm also in this optimistic camp. And I think that uh, 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 literature uh, and this literary community is uh, something that will uh, help us get over it through these uh, situations and to open up uh, uh, a new world in a way. So uh, this, this is what literature does, it's, it's dreaming up new worlds that we can live in. And, and I, uh, I, I really hope that uh, we will uh, see that world. Wonderful. So, you know, I think we've got some questions coming in. So I'm going to pick the questions for you right now. So there is a question for, uh, uh, you know, there is a question which is directed at all of you. Do you think non-English European literature is viewed uh, in, a, in the same way 
uh, I think this is a question from an Indian reader that is it viewed in the same way as say Indian literature written in the languages is viewed across the world. So do you think that, uh, um, um, uh, let me just see, uh, the decolonizing movement and increasing the diversity initiatives brought to light. So what they want to know is that, do you think there is a kind of a, a similarity between sharing literatures which are non-English? So uh, would you like to address that, uh, Matthias, would you like to take that question where, you know, of, uh, of um, how do you view literatures written in non-English languages? Are they sort of, do, do you think there's a movement or there's a, uh, 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 there's a, a, a bigger battle they need to fight for discoverability? Uh, well, in my experience, I have to say that unfortunately still European literature is highlighted uh, more than probably in global in a global sense it uh, it should be like in percent uh, but for example in Germany there is a very and we can see this also in the United States and in in, in different European countries that there is a, a strong movement um, which highlights um, those post-colonial topics, I would say, and also identities that are, are not European or uh, identities, identities in Europe that uh, are not Euro uh, originally European in the sense of, you know, history. And uh, so I'm quite optimistic that what is speaking of hope, right, I guess that uh, what is changing right now in the whole world, and the pandemic is one example because it forces us to change, uh, is a global conscience uh, in a sense of that it's not longer, you know, Europe ruling the world as it was uh, 100 years ago or even 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. And it's not the US, but it's uh, the whole world and there are literatures uh, and there are cultures in the in the whole world that are dealing with the same problems because it's like uh, you know we have only one ball on which we live and uh, and this uh, and this little planet uh, is uh, we have not much space so we have to deal with the same problems climate change pandemic we can see it really very well right now with the pandemic it's not enough to you know vaccinate the Europeans and the and the Americans. Uh, everybody has to to be vaccinated, and I think I, or I hope that people will understand it. And I guess that this um, small avant-garde, I would say, this open-minded, politically thinking people all over the world, they were they will uh, bring something into the whole global conscious. And I think literature is a, 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 a very important part of it. So I hope that we will, for example, in Europe, will see much more Indian uh, translations in the future or African translations uh, on and, and so on and so on. So I'm seeing a small change in this global conscience, but I think it's not still, you know, we're not there. We're not where we should be. There is yet. Uh, Rodan, would you like to comment on that? On this? Yes. Uh, 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 what what I what I like in English language, you are allowed to be very bad writer. In English, you are allowed to speak very bad in English. The English language is very friendly. And, and it looked like a McDonald's restaurant. Everywhere you come by to eat very fast and you go away. If we have this meeting now in Dutch and we are speaking in four or five kind of Dutch, it will be impossible because, oh, what you mean? Oh, what you think? What you mean? But the English language made everything easy. And I think uh, uh, if you are uh, uh, writing book in English in India, you can send it to the publisher, world edition, for example, in Amsterdam. It, it gives you a lot of possibility, and uh, and 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 this is what I be. I think we need this bad language to uh, travel very easy to the another. I'm very right. thankful for so, the uh, English language. So, uh, you know, there is a question for, for you, Rodan yes. Ananta, who wants to know that how do you keep your soul 
intact and focus on your creative adventures while addressing the challenges of creating and you know and, and uh, writing you know, and, and you know, we, we know the kind of life and the kind your writings have brought out the kind of difficulties you faced as an asylum seeker so they want to know how do you keep your focus and your soul together this is i uh, i will time. tell you i'm born in war in iraq i grow up in another war i uh, finish my study as a civil engineer in another war once i asked my mother how old are you she said eight wars i said with years she said we don't have the years in iraq but i learned one thing i learned one thing from the war not from the piece of from the literature the war learned me to be very happy that i breathe this breathing you know this is the life that you wake up that you take a shower it is very rich for me and this is from the war i never forget that lesson i don't need meditation or yoga to uh, forget this is to be happen in my childhood i it's i saw everything i spent nine and a half years in the refugees camp in holland in the middle of the freedom i was as animal nine and a half years but i was very happy always i'm breathing this breathing breathing and i oh i have a place this very little things make me the most rich from the people i know and uh, this is i learned just be, uh, happy to be breathing to be alive the most beautiful job or book or art or freedom not to have the freedom of europe no or freedom of the spirituality or india of the economy of germany no just to breathe just to to, to understand that you are alive same the sheep you know or the dog he don't know who he is tomorrow or yesterday he just now this is very simple you know but it make me really always feeling uh, as i get marijuana or something but i never smoke or drink alcohol i just happy like that wonderful uh meel is there's a question uh, from Ak akanksha who says that how do we keep uh, how do we change the perception of readers about being lost in translation and uh, this is uh, akanksha is a translation student and she wants to know how do we change that perception in the readers uh, about how that text is lost in translation uh, would you like to address that because you know you with your background in uh, in uh, 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 you know your uh, academic background would you uh, you know be able to answer this question for a student who would like to understand how to change yes, the I'm perception I could try I could try uh, so uh, I have translated myself so uh, I'm also familiar uh, from the other side of it so um, and uh, of course uh, I, I think that what uh, Matthias has said is uh, exactly right this uh, one Estonian translator has also uh, said it that the translate uh, uh, translation can be better or worse than original it cannot be the same so it is always so that uh, 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 with translations you may, may win something and you can lose something but uh, you can't uh, achieve exactly uh, the parity so uh, the question lost uh, in translation uh, it does of course exist but uh, uh, at the same time you just can't uh, uh, say that uh, the translation is a, a copy uh, it, it's it's a new creation, as both uh, Rodan and and, and, and Matthias have uh, said it uh, before. So uh, uh, I, I think that it's not uh, something to be afraid of. Uh, translation is something that uh, uh, a translator should do with uh, joy, and, uh, uh, and with the idea that uh, uh, the writing can be improved. Uh, it, it could be better. 
So, uh, uh, and I, I think it's a, a Shiva, but so it's, uh, no, I, I don't think so that uh, translation is always something that you lost uh, or you lose something. So, no. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, uh, according to you, a, a translation, even a bad translation, is better than no translation. So it's always a good thing to have a translation. So I think we are now coming to, you know, I'd like to go ahead. There are a lot of more questions from Nikhil and Jessica, and there are, uh, you know, a lot of young people, students who are asking questions. But I think we need to now come to the closing comments from all of you. Uh, you know, acknowledging the fact that this European literature, the EU PL Prize, has changed your lives in in a way, in positive ways, and as well as given you a kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, outreach to readers in different languages, in different geographies. Um, just a closing comment that, you know, uh, you know, what is, what is it that you're looking forward to in this year? And uh, what is it that you'd like to leave our viewers with a last comment? Starting with Anne, would you like to say something? Because there are a lot of, you know, students here as well as uh, publishers. Something that you'd like to say about maybe relationships that could be built with European publishers and Indian publishers, looking at translations of these wonderful writers in India. Something that could really, you know, uh, speak out and uh, take that message forward. Over to you, Anne. Well, I, I, I think it would be wonderful if Indian uh, publishers would look at the uh, wealth of uh, Europe and authors who are done right in English, the, uh, I like the McDonald language, uh, uh, but I think it's, it's a bit more sophisticated than McDonald, but okay, whatever. But I think it, it would be great if we could uh, uh, do exchanges and have more Indian authors uh, uh, being translated into uh, a lot of European languages and, and vice versa. I think it, we are all enriched when we enter into one uh, particular experience in a book and, and, and learn to live the life of others. For me, it's, I haven't been traveling in a, in a year, but I've been traveling through books and, and this is, I, I miss the real travel, but that has been quite a, a good compensation. So let's work together more and, and increase translation. We'll understand each other. So more here's better. That. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you so much, Rodan. Thank you, Milis and Matthias. I'm looking forward to reading more of your work. And I think what we're going to take the time now to, you know, uh, to bring your messages, to bring your books to India. We are going to all work together towards that. Thank you to the Jaipur Bookmark, to the Jaipur Literature Fest. Thank you to all the wonderful, uh, you know, the uh, audiences who've been sending such interesting questions and to the wonderful team at uh, which, you know, the, the behind this uh, great festival. Thank you everyone. And looking forward to other sessions to, be, to follow. Bye. Thank you. Thank you Ann Bergman, Matthias Navrat, Millie Sri Rental, and Rodan Al Galidi for this insightful session which threw up so many questions and answered many others. Thank you Neeta Gupta for being such a fabulous moderator. And a big thank you to all of you for being a wonderfully attentive audience. This session was organized by Cultural Relations Platform, CRP, an EU-funded project in collaboration with Jaipur Bookmark. All our sessions will be available to view later on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Once again, we would like to thank all our festival advisors and partners for generously supporting us. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and will stay tuned for the next session. Indian publishing goes digital. On-ground challenges and learnings. Arunava Sinha, Isha Chatterjee, Giriraj Kiradu, Kanan Sundaram, Priya Kapoor and Ravi DC in conversation with Aditi Maheshwari Goyal. Thank you once again. And now we present an interesting reading from the JBM short series.